you know already that in libraries we are basically database driven systems. I already told you that library catalog, access and registers all are databases. Apart from this, if you think about what are the categories of databases available in the libraries, there are mainly two categories. First one is the in-house developed databases. Say for example, when you are developing a library catalog, this is the kind one that means you have developed it in-house. Similarly, institutional repositories you have developed uh, in-house. But if you are thinking about the other databases that is the publisher created databases like uh, bibliographic databases, abstracting indexing databases, union catalogs, then uh, full text databases all are basically libraries buying from you know uh, reputed vendors and database developer. So, these databases are hugely costly for example, you already know the name of Scopus. Scopus is a bibliographic database developed by Elsevier Science Incorporation and you will be amazed to know that Scopus cost around rupees 12 lakhs per annum. So, in most of the Indian libraries apart from a few elite libraries can subscribe to Scopus databases. Same is the case with the other commercial databases like Science Direct, Web of Science, Web of Knowledge. So, under such circumstances, what small scale, medium scale libraries in India uh, can survive? So, in this tutorial, we will be learning an alternative route through which you know not so fortunate libraries can also utilize database services available in the public domain. But before making a quantum jump into uh, that tutorial, we need to have an idea what is called open access databases, what, we, what do we mean by the term open access, what are the different routes and services available to open access. Now, if you look into the screen, you can see that open knowledge is basically a term which includes different kind of open access publications and not only publication, it includes data that means scientific data, geographic data, population data, etcetera. But in each and every cases, this must follow an open route that means submission should be open, peer review process that means the quality control of data sets must be open and access will always remain open without any kind of discrimination. So, open knowledge movement as a whole includes different kind of data sets, different kind of publication systems like journals, theses. Uh, monographs, etcetera and different kind of general information produced mainly by the government in a democratic setup. Now, and what is an open access publisher then? An open access publisher is a publisher who are producing open access materials. Normally, different universities, different research institutes, learned societies are providing uh, you know different knowledge objects in the public domain free of cost. So, this if we know as a library professional uh, how to tackle, where to get and how to handle in the library system that can be beneficial for the end users. Now, one question is uh, basically coming to your mind that uh, why should we go for you know open access. Open access is uh, basically important from a, uh, for a uh, country like India, we are developing countries, we cannot spend huge amount of money in procuring you know different kind of subscribe materials. So, there the term open access is supporting libraries both philosophically as well as economically. So, first take the issue of philosophy. The issue is uh, of philosophy is that most of the research you know uh, when you are talking about databases we are basically you know handling different kind of knowledge objects like uh, journal papers uh, like uh, you know thesis and dissertation like different kind of scientific data sets. So, you must remember that most of these are basically product of research and in a developing country like India, most of the research is supported by the government. All over the world, it is estimated that 92 to 93 percent of R and D activities are supported by the uh, government. And the moment, uh, you know, uh, we got the government money, the funding for doing R and D activities we tend to publish our uh, result of uh, research and we tend to publish in different 
uh, foreign publications. So, in India most of the foreign publications are again procured by the libraries. So, government is basically paying twice for each and every research. First, government is funding us to for uh, going on different kind of R and D activities. Now, the moment I got some kind of success in my R and D endeavor, I tend to publish my paper in a foreign journal. Again 98 to 99 percent libraries are supported by the government and those journals are basically procured by the libraries. So, first government is paying to do the research and then government is, is buying the same research report which is already funded by the government. So, it is a double edge payment system kind of thing going on in India. So, this is actually philosophically the point is that if a research is publicly funded, the result of the research must be available in the public domain free of cost for everybody. Now, if we consider the second uh, you know, factor that is the economics, as I told you uh, again you know uh, earlier that these data sets are uh, very costly and it is difficult for Indian libraries to procure Indian libraries to procure each and every databases. So, there if we know where to find the open access knowledge objects you know uh, efficiently and how to integrate those resources and services inside our library system, you know we can serve our users without paying any extra money to anybody. But uh, let us see uh, some kind of um, uh, historical issues because uh, you know um, the most of the cases open knowledge object is basically uh, containing the uh, journal papers around 90 percent of the research 91 to 92 percent of the research is basically published still in journal papers. So, first uh, take the history of the journal uh, publication in the world. If you look into the screen you can see the first scholarly journal published in the year 1665. The first peer review process introduced 10 years later that is 1675 and right from the 17th century to till date we are following the same model of subscription based peer reviewed journal system. That means, journals are peer reviewed, those are available against subscription uh, rates, we need to pay subscription fees in the very early of the you know uh, um, subscription year. Say for example, in most of the cases the subscription year for journal is the calendar year that is January to December. So, we need to pay uh, you know uh, previous year uh, September or October for the next year issues. So, we need to pay in advance for the uh, journal papers. Now, this kind of uh, situation that, that means uh, you know uh, different kind of publication system uh, related with the journal uh, uh, you know uh, journal domain right from the year 1665 to till date are based on subscription that is basically the toll based access you pay and access. Now, if you see the evolution of the scholarship we started with the manuscript then uh, came the Gutenberg revolution printed uh, uh, text came into picture and in the early 90s started the digital text. So, all this 400 or 500 years we moved from the handwritten manuscript to the digital text. Now, if you look into this particular graph you can see a very interesting feature. Say for example, the blue color bar actually indicates number of new print journals in a year. Say for example, here we have given data set from 1991 to 2006. The blue bar indicates number of new print journals in a given year say 91 around uh, you know 1500 plus journals. This maroon bar indicates the online journals or e-journals. The first online journal appeared in the uh, year 1996 and you can easily understand from the graph within 4 years it outnumbered the print journals. And if you look into the figure in the 2006, the number of new online journals is around uh, 2800, but the print journal reduced to 4. So, this actually uh, shows a paradigm shift from the printed publication system to the digital publication system, but unfortunately the model remains same. We need to pay to access print journals as well as we need to pay to access digital uh, you know uh, journals or online journals or e-journals. So, that is the uh, you know data collected from the ALA report 2007. 
Now, you may ask that, uh, so, so what, what is the problem? If we follow the same model of subscription based or toll based access, what is the problem with the libraries? Now, here you see problem lies here. If you look into the graph very carefully, you see here this red uh, you know lines indicates the journal price. Now, journal price increased during the period from 1986 to 2002, journal price increased in the tune of plus 222 percent out of the world exorbitant price rise. Why I am saying out of the world? Because how can you compare whether it is a price rise is a high or moderate or low? You can compare the price rise with the you know CPI, consumer price index. Now, if we calculate or wholesale price index WPI or if you calculate the increase in wholesale price index during this year, here you see this graph actually indicates the consumer price index, this yellow line. So, it says during this period that means 1986 to 2002 consumer price index increased in the tune of plus 64 percent, but journal price increased in the tune of plus 222 percent. No commercial reason, no economic reason can explain this exorbitant price rise. Another interesting feature is that this blue bar indicates the R and D expenditure of government of US. So, R and D expenditure of government of US, the most affluent government of the world is increased during this period of time in the tune of plus 120 percent. So, in fact, data shows that even the most affluent government of the world is falling behind. They cannot keep pace with the exorbitant price rise of the journal. And please remember, I already told you 90 to 92 percent of the research is basically reported in journal and journal is basically going out of the hand of the libraries as well as the readers. Now, another interesting issue, uh, uh, now, but before going to this, let me show you that if you want to uh, have a details regarding these statistics and other issues related to uh, you know uh, open access journal system, publication system. Uh, there is a blog maintained by the Peter Suber. Peter Suber is the professional evangelist, uh, a professor of MIT. He is basically promoting the open access movement. So, he is writing a regular blog and from this URL you can have details of the you know uh, open access journal publication system. The uh, particular thing of the uh, journal system is on the one hand is basically exorbitant price rise and on the other hand no economic reason can explain this exorbitant price rise because I am just asking you one very simple question. Can you give me one example that where an industry is running without paying anything to procure raw materials? you will say uh, that uh, that is economically impossible. We have to procure raw materials, we need to process that and we need to you know send the product to the market for uh, profit. But the journal publishing industry is only exception to this golden rule of economics. They do not pay single buck of money to anybody for procuring raw materials. Say for example, authors are submitting their papers to the uh, journals. Do they pay authors? No. The same paper they send for the senior faculty member or researcher for peer review or quality control. Do they pay them? No. Or if they pay them, just a mere honorarium. So, they are procuring raw materials from the author without paying anything to anybody. So, the same material is quality controlled by the uh, senior faculty member, senior academia without again any honorarium. So, the entire system is basically based on the freely available author driven journal papers. Now, they bind together those papers, published as a issue and charge libraries or individual heavily. So, the entire you know uh, 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 thing is going beyond explanation how the exorbitant price rise can be supported, where an industry is not paying anything to anybody for procuring raw material, how they are charging so heavily uh, for libraries to procure that. So, that is the thing that uh, nobody can explain why it is happening, but uh, it is obvious that every year they are going uh, you know tend to rise the price. Why this is happening? Because every year they are rise the price, some libraries are dropping the titles. 
So, to, to make the profit margin intact or to keep the profit margin in, in, intact, they again in the next year rise uh, you know price, again some libraries are dropping title. So, it become a vicious cycle. Every year they are rising price and every year you know libraries are dropping title because library budget is not increasing in the tune of journal price. You know that exorbitant rate no libraries can touch upon even libraries in US. So, what is the solution of this particular problem, but before uh, entering into the solution let me show you uh, the special situation in India. As you know uh, India is a developing country and uh, the situation of journal management in libraries is even worse in India. Most of the reputed journals are published in developed countries and are, and are monopolized by a few publisher. I have used here the term monopoly, but I non-economist, but I think the right term should be the oligopoly. Monopoly is the uh, you know is a condition where the entire market is dominated by one major single player, but oligopoly is the concept where five or six major players are basically dominating that uh, you know market. If you have a very close look in the journal publishing system, you, you, you see that it is a complete fit for oligopoly kind of thing. If you go for science and technology, it is Elsevier. If you go for mathematics and statistics, it is John Wiley. If you go for the material science, it is Kluwer. So, each knowledge domain is actually divided into number of major publishers. Elsevier never published a journal in pure mathematics. Similarly, John Wiley never published a journal on pure chemistry or physics. So, it is quite clear that they have an hidden agreement, they do not enter with each other domains and they tied their hand together to increase the price you know artificially. So, that is one of the problem and most of these uh, you know publishers are uh, belonging to foreign countries. So, each year India is paying a huge sum of money in foreign currency for procuring journals uh, from the uh, foreign countries. Apart from this problem, another problem I already told that in India most of the cases the research is doubly funded. First government is funded for uh, R and D activities, then they again buying the research report in the form of journal papers from different foreign publishers. For, for each research government is paying twice. So, these are the problem associated with India and Indian libraries and Indian reader, readerships are suffering like anything. So, as a whole we can say that this toll based or subscription based journal system is basically creating a readership barrier, a publishing barrier. If you look into the screen you can see that research is publicly funded for the personal academic effort supported by the institutions. The moment something published by an authors, author signs have a rights to with, with the publisher in order to publish. So, that means they are giving uh, their intellectual property free of cost to the publisher and publishers make huge profit and I request you to see the spelling of the term profit. Uh, it is in, in the pound and dollars. So, it indicates I try to indicate that most of the foreign uh, you know publishers charging in pounds and dollars and we, we are basically paying those uh, you know um, payment from our precious foreign reserve. Now, <clears throat> what is the uh, you know um, tangible return to the authors? Mere their career progresses, their prestige increases and nothing else. So, we the, the authors in the developing countries uh, blindly giving the right of our intellectual labor to the foreign publishers. Again my country is basically paying a huge sum of money to procure those research reports and in return I am not getting any material benefit only my prestige increases as a publisher in a branded journal and I am getting promotion or my career advances. So, that should not be the target of academia. Academia should work for the open availability of the research results and this philosophy will support libraries to attract readership and to disseminate information to, to the right person at the right time. So, any services created by the libraries will not be hindered by the you know exorbitant price rise of the journal. Now, <coughs> I have already given you uh, data up to 2002. Uh, you know, um, uh, 
If we go for the last uh, you know 5 years data, you can have a look into the screen that 2011 to 2015, the wholesale price index in this 5 years increased in the tune of plus 11 percent, but the journal price in this 5 years increased in the tune of plus 58 percent and library budgets all over the world reduced to minus 29 percent. So, under such circumstances, the question comes that how libraries can serve their users without you know increasing or without giving exorbitant payment to the journal publishers. So, we need a new model apart from this toll based subscription based uh, journal access model. This new model is called open access model and open access model if you look into the history started in 1980s, the first online open access journal appeared in the 1980s. Then physics people took the lead, they developed archive as a repository where all print of the uh, articles written by the faculty members of Los Alamos University donated to archive and physicists across the world can access that archive uh, you know repository. Higher Press is launched at Stanford University. In 1997, PubMed uh, launched as a open access data sets for the biological science people. Then uh, interesting development uh, uh, you know happened in 1998, association of research libraries led a coalition of uh, you know academicians and librarians and they developed a body called SPARC, scholarly publishing and academic resource coalition. It is basically handled by Association of Research Libraries US. If you look into the uh, development uh, other sister you know development of other sister projects, other important important projects were Serpa Romeo project which basically shows user that what journals are open access journals and what is the status of that journal because Serpa Romeo project classified the entire publishing categories into four groups. Green publisher who allow you know archiving both print and post print version of the paper, blue publisher which allows only post print archiving, Green, uh, yellow publisher which allows only print archiving and white publisher which do not allow you know uh, any sort of archiving. So, green publishers are basically welcomed and uh, fortunately most of the big publishing houses are uh, you know rapidly changing from white to green for example, LGBS science, Cluer, all are now green publisher. That means, if I publish a paper in an LGBS journal system, then uh, you know I can archive the same thing in open access uh, repositories as well as in uh, you know university repositories. But <coughs> as a library professional, uh, one question is basically coming to your mind that what are the tertiary sources available uh, uh, you know to know about the open access resources. How can I know how many open access journals available in a given you know domain? What are the open access repositories available in the uh, in on a given domain? So, let us uh, you know go through some open data sets available freely in the public domain. But before that you must know that the entire open access route can be divided into two channels. One is called the gold path that means the open access journals and other is called the green path that means open access repositories. Now, the difference between the gold path and green path is that in gold path your open access article will remain open uh, uh, you know for time indefinite, but in case of green path it indicates that first you published your journal paper in a commercial journal either the pip print version or the post print version of that journal you can publish in a you know um, open access repositories or you can archive in your university repository. So, that is the green path first you published in commercial channel then the pip print version or post print version of the paper you can archive in open access resource uh, repositories from where anyone can download print access your paper. In case of gold path the most important tertiary tools or the open access database is DOAJ directory of open access journal. It lists around 11500 plus open access journals and around half of them are basically available as searchable in the article level. So, if you see the 
interface of DOAJ, you can see that you can search by both journal and you can search by both article. So, around 6900 plus journals are searchable at the article level, 136 countries are contributing to this data set and till date there are 22 lakh articles available free of cost for your user. You need to tell your user to access it or you can create different secondary services on the top of this DOAJ data sets. We can harvest DOAJ, we can integrate DOAJ into our library system, we can uh, prepare different kind of tools through which query can be forwarded to DOAJ to you know uh, to know what are the open access articles available from DOAJ against a particular query. Similarly, there are many other tools in the next tutorial we will be going to cover this.